Hi, I'm Shannon. I hold degrees in psychology, sociology, and criminal justice. And today I want to talk a little bit about some research I did during my senior year of my undergrad. For my school, we had to do a capstone. Usually capstones are saved for master's and doctorate levels, but my school uh, required a capstone on most degrees. And during this time, I was a psychology major. I got my associates in psychology and sociology at Richland Community College and my bachelor's in psychology and criminal justice at Millican University. And we were instructed to come up with a research project for our capstone. And by research, I mean actually conduct research, uh, surveys, whatever, to answer a question we may have. And this got me thinking. For so long, I, I have been, I have consumed myself with the horror genre. That doesn't mean that that's the only genre I like. Uh, as you can see in the background, I've got action figure collections, love Ghostbusters. But the majority of these books here, are all horror and true crime. And so I found that after reading a really good horror book or watching a really good horror film, that my mood actually improved. And so I wanted to conduct my capstone research on the correlation between horror media and mood. I have to say I was intrigued by the results. Growing up in the 1980s and 90s, my generation was bombarded with horror media. Movies like Friday the 13th and A Nightmare on Elm Street transcended the big screen and moved into pop culture. As the two most popular horror films of the era, we received spin-offs in the forms of TV shows like Freddy's Nightmares and Friday the 13th the series, as well as comic books, toys, lunchboxes, posters, and more. Freddy Krueger had his own telephone hotline that you could call and hear short stories from the ghoul himself. Further, one of the most popular talk shows for kids at the time, Don't Just Sit There, on Nickelodeon, even brought Robert England onto an episode in full Freddy makeup, and Arsenio Hall managed to interview Jason Voorhees himself on one of his late night episodes. I remember as a kid staying up late, long after my mom told me to go to bed, and watching Freddy's Nightmares on my small black and white dial TV. Anytime my friends and I had sleepovers, we'd usually have horror movie marathons like Halloween, Friday the 13th, and Nightmare on Elm Street. When the movie Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare came out, my brother and I, along with a few of our friends, would reenact some of the best scenes in the film, and we weren't even teenagers yet. Because of the massive popularity of the genre, horror began to transcend adult entertainment and spreading into children's entertainment as well. Being a part of the Fox Kids generation, every year our favorite shows would receive Halloween episodes that weren't just set around the holiday, but actually had some kind of horror element to it. Tales from the Crypt received a Saturday morning animated spinoff for kids called Tales from the Crypt Keeper, and R.L. Stein moved from writing children's joke books to becoming the name in children's horror with his popular Goosebumps series, which received a television series based on the books, as well as a massive amount of marketing with merchandising deals and movies. One of the highlights of my week back then was SNCC, Saturday Night Nickelodeon, for those of you who weren't born yet. During this two-hour TV block included one of my favorite shows, Are You Afraid of the Dark? Very similar to Goosebumps, it was horror meant for kids, but more on the scary side than the former. During this era, you couldn't walk five feet without seeing something that reminded you of the horror genre. When kids grew out of Goosebumps, Stein had his hugely popular Fear Street book series waiting for them, which recently received film adaptations on Netflix. And then once our tastes had matured further, authors like Stephen King and Dean Koontz were waiting for us with open arms, like a loving grandparent greeting us for the summer. When we grew up, so did the horror genre. It became less about blood and guts and more psychological. Films like Scream, I Know What You Did Last Summer, and Final Destination didn't just scare us, but made us think as well. Then came films like Saw that expanded upon the psychological aspects of horror, but brought back the blood and guts. That asked the question, how much do you want to live? But soon after, the horror genre began to move backward, returning us to updated versions of simpler times. With zombie movies and TV shows, paranormal thrillers, vampires, and werewolves, the list goes on and on. So why are we so obsessed with horror? As someone who's immersed himself into the genre for most of his life, I've asked myself that very question many times. What makes it so fascinating? Why do I enjoy it so much? I took my love for the genre to a completely new level a few years back and began producing and directing short films for YouTube that were horror specific. And then I took my love for it a step further and began writing books in the genre. 
With this, I've immersed myself into horror literature, having read around 90 horror books in a year. It was after reading one of those books, while taking one of my professor's advanced experimental psychology classes, that I got the idea for my capstone research. I had just finished reading a book by my favorite author, Darcy Coates, and found myself sitting and contemplating it afterward. I felt my mood increase from relaxed to mundane to excited and happy, so I began to wonder, does horror have the same effect on the moods of others? Does horror actually improve our mood? Mary Shelley said, if I cannot inspire love, I will cause fear. Before we answer that question, we should probably take a look at some of the research. Horror is defined as an intense feeling of fear, shock, or disgust. The genre itself is intended to frighten, scare, or disgust. Literary historian J.A. Cudden defined the horror story as a piece of fiction in prose of variable length which shocks or even frightens the readers, or perhaps induces a feeling of repulsion or loathing. Because of this definition, a wide variety of subgenres can be placed under the horror umbrella, such as mystery and crime thrillers, suspense, paranormal, slasher, true crime, etc. In an article by Yen Cabbage, reporting on a Statista.com analysis, horror subgenres make up three of the top ten most popular genres in literature. In another analysis by Statista.com, horror and suspense make up a total of $83.104 billion of the box office when combined. But separately, what we think of as horror generally brought in $13.65 billion, with thrillers and suspense bringing in $19.9 billion since 2015. As you can see, by separating them, they make up the fifth and sixth most popular film genre spots behind Adventure for a combined $147.199 billion at the box office. So why are these so genres so popular? What do they have in common? The answer to that is suspense. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, suspense is defined as a state or feeling of excited or anxious uncertainty about what may happen. Of course, most genres have some element of suspense, which is why we like them so much. It would be quite boring to watch or, or read something that has no suspense whatsoever. This means that we can't just contribute our mood to the suspense aspect alone, since everything has suspense. But other researchers have their own explanations. Bantanaki presented the paradox of horror, which he claimed was fear as a positive emotion. Even though Smut's hypothesis was that emotions brought on by horror were unpleasant and painful. But Bantanaki took this idea and said that in many cases, the emotions and physical responses brought on by horror can actually be a positive response and outright enjoyable, such as rushing adrenaline, increased heart rate, nervousness, etc. All of these are physical responses that we see from suspense during the climactic portion of the media, and the release when the resolution comes can be a pleasurable experience with a rush of endorphins. Childhood play is a good example of this. Such as with games like Tag and Hide and Seek, children receive the same physiological responses during the build of suspense, where they try their hardest not to be found or caught by the person who's it. The excitement builds and builds until finally they're either caught or manage to evade being caught and someone else becomes it. Other forms of childhood play that can be an example of this are things like climbing trees, balancing on logs or branches, or even performing neighborhood pranks. These are exciting forms of play for children that involve risk and test boundaries and possibilities in order to master risky situations and confront fear. Think of movies like The Sandlot, where the kids dread the dog behind the fence, but Benny decides to go over the fence, face the beast, and get the ball, a feat I attempted when I was in second grade that wasn't as successful and led to two sadistic pit bulls chasing after me and using my thigh as a chew toy. Hudson found that audio-visual processing becomes more active during slow-building suspense. This, of course, means the neurotransmitters in the occipital and parietal lobes become more active, which can also lead to a type of autonomous sensory meridian response, ASMR, in those who are sensitive to it. This is a tingling sensation that usually begins 
begins on the scalp and moves down the back of the neck and upper spine. But this sensation becomes time-locked to the periods of arousal. And once the suspense resolves itself, the brain is able to relax, similar to sexual or even narcotic experiences. The University of Westminster produced a study that was funded by Hollywood and wasn't peer-reviewed or scientifically published, where they found that watching a 90-minute horror movie can burn 150 calories. The study took a look at multiple horror films, and for the purpose of this presentation, we'll focus on the results they attained from The Exorcist, which they said can burn up to 158 calories. In my study, I hypothesized that exposure to horror media improves mood. The study from the University of Westminster compares watching horror movies to exercise, and if we continue to compare the two, we know that regular exercise can help ease depression and anxiety by way of a chemical response where endorphins are released that places the individual into an improved mood state. While many believe that horror is supposed to leave the audience in a state of anxious, nerve-wracking fear, making them afraid to turn their lights off at night and jump at every noise when they're home alone, I had a different idea. The enjoyment of horror media isn't about fear at all. For this study, my null was that horror has no effect on mood, with the hypothesis being that horror media has a positive effect on mood. As stated, I propose the hypothesis in order to determine if this is in fact the case. I created a survey with two completely different stimuli. 60 random participants took part in the survey, which contained 10 questions. 30 of the participants were presented with a video clip, and the other 30 were presented with a literary passage. Both of the stimuli focused on the same scene from the film and original novel, The Exorcist. In the scene, the two priests are performing the exorcism on a little girl by the name of Reagan, who is possessed by the demon Pazuzu. The scene also includes the famous head-spinning visual. The first question asks participants to rate the extent they enjoy experiencing horror media, with one being equal to never, and five being equal to several times a week. According to the responses, the majority of participants said they expose themselves to horror media several times a week, 38.3%. Participants were then asked what their favorite horror subgenre was, and ghost stories were the most popular response at 21.7%. The next four questions asked participants to place their responses on a five-point scale where one was equal to none and five was equal to a lot. 41.7% of participants ranked their enjoyment of horror at five. 36.7% of participants said they experienced no fear before consuming horror media. This question was asked to determine the most likely mood that leads people to exposing themselves to horror media. 38% of participants said they experienced some fear while exposing themselves to horror media, but an equal majority of participants said they either experienced no fear or a good amount of fear after consuming horror media at 23.3%. When the participants were asked how they'd rate their enjoyment of horror in film, the majority at 43.3% indicated that they took a great deal of enjoyment in horror films, and a 38.3% majority said they'd take a great deal of enjoyment in horror literature. To determine if exposure to horror media has a positive effect on mood, participants were asked to rank their mood and were then presented with the video or literary stimulus. After exposure to the stimulus, they were then asked to rate their mood once more. The results indicated mood improved slightly after exposure to the film stimulus in the number 2 rating but decreased in the number 5 rating, while all others remained the same. When it came to the literary stimulus, mood decreased in the number 2 rating but increased in the number 5 category. When I analyzed the data, I performed an ANOVA that showed there was a significant interaction of time, which was defined as before and after exposure, and type of media which was defined as book and film. The simple effects showed mood was significantly higher in the film condition, but didn't significantly differ in the book condition. When taken in total, there was an increase in mood in 8.3% of participants. A repeated measures ANOVA was ran, where time before exposure to media versus after exposure to media was the within subjects variable, and type of media, literature versus movie, was the between subjects variable. Current mood was the dependent variable. Results showed that there was no significant main effects of time or type of media, but there was a significant interaction of time x type of media. Specifically, simple effects showed that participants' mood before was significantly higher than after for participants in the film condition, but mood did not significantly differ before or after 
for participants in the book condition. As a result, we can reject the null and say that exposure to horror media does have a positive impact on mood. I shared my results with my favorite horror author, Darcy Coates, on her Discord and asked her for a quote to end my presentation with, since it was my reaction to reading one of her books that led to the research. This was her response. Horror can be extremely cathartic. It lets us confront our fears in a safe way, know them better, and overcome them, even just by closing a book once we've finished it. Hiding from the dark won't make it go away, but shining a flashlight into it can make it less frightening. So I will fully admit that I am not that great with statistics. I required a lot of help analyzing these results from my professor, but statistics is a required course with a psychology degree. I'm not sure if maybe I have dyscalculia, which affects the portion of the brain that understands math. I, I've always had trouble with any type of math, whether it be simple math equations or dates or understanding numbers and figures and stuff. I've always had a problem with that. That gives me reason to believe that I may have dyscalculia, which is often attributed to autism. But I found the results of this very, very interesting because even though the results were very minimal in increased mood, they did indicate that exposure to horror media, whether it be film or book, does have an improvement on mood. So what do you think? Tell me your thoughts in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and share with your family and friends. 